I'd like to uh, again thank um, the organizers, organizers of the meeting, Gautam and Girl, for inviting me. Um, getting me here was um, probably a bigger hassle than they had anticipated. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, I was asked to speak about uh, the use of ATG triggering for IUI cycles as opposed to IVF. And this is really a very broad topic. So I'm going to really speak in, in broad strokes here and, um, and give just a, a, an overview of this topic in very broad strokes. Um, so our standard of care for the treatment of unexplained infertility is, as I tell my patients, more eggs, more sperm, hope something hits something. It's really a very um, almost juvenile view of how to treat a disease, just hope to get more stuff where they need to be and, and hope something takes. And, um, and, th and that's sort of our approach to the treatment of unexplained infertility. And in our practice, 50 to 60% of our patients are unexplained infertility because the majority of patients that are easy to take care of, they get take ca taken care of by their primary care doctors before they actually get to my center. So we have a, a huge amount of unexplained infertility um, that's really very frustrating to, excuse me, to treat because of um, how, how, you know, unfocused our approach is in, in their treatment. Um, so we do this concept of more eggs and more sperm by using ovulation induction and getting them to make more eggs. And then um, in our practice, we tend to ultrasound monitor them to make sure that our treatment is effective. And then we give them HCG to release their eggs and do an IUI at the time we think is going to be the most likely to um, produce a conception. And, um, and we take that approach with the expectation that it's actually going to help them get pregnant. And so really the idea of this talk is to discuss whether or not that actually works. So we're going to review the role of HCG during ovulation induction, um, talk a little bit about the timing of HCG in the IUI, and, um, and whether or not the HCG itself is even appropriate. So why do we think HCG would work? Well, for one thing is it gives this concept of certain timing. We know that when we give HCG, our patients are going to ovulate somewhere between 35 and 39 hours after their HCG. And so we could feel pretty confident when we do our IUI that we're doing our IUI within that window of receptivity. And it makes it much easier to schedule. If we don't have to rely on them using an ovulation predictor kit and doing it at the right time and calling it off hours, it just, you know, busy practices, we want simple treatment. And by using HCG, we can get everything scheduled. But there are some pretty big disadvantages. The HCG increased the costs, both for the drug itself. Um, recombinant HCG in the US costs about $100 an application. Um, and w but we then need to ultrasound monitor them to know when the appropriate time to give them HCG. And ultrasound monitoring is significantly increasing the cost. So when we look at, and I'm gonna, I'll probably bring this up again, when we, bring, when we look at the costs for a, a single cycle when, when we're using HCG versus using urinary, urinary, urinary LH, we're increasing cost by about a third. Another disadvantage may be that we shorten the follicular phase. Um, Mark Fritz, back in the 1990s at UNC, described the fact that when we look for the natural ovulation in the clomid cycle, most patients are going to ovulate around 24 millimeters. Um, but yet we're giving HCG typically around 18 millimeters. So we, we're shortening their follicular phase by two or three days. Um, some would argue that that's a disadvantage. Mark certainly would. Um, some would actually argue that that's an advantage because when you look at IVF and so much of our data on IUI have been extrapolated from IVF and that might be a problem in itself. But when you look at IVF and you do retrievals on 24 millimeter follicles, you have a high percentage of those follicles that are going to be degenerated. And so some would argue that by giving HCG, we're actually improving their outcome by shortening the follicular phase. And then, of course, there's the question about pregnancy rates. That's really what we're all interested in. And the question then becomes, are we improving our ultimate outcome, our pregnancy rates, by using um, HCG to trigger? And again, some would argue we're improving them, and some are arguing that we won't improve it. And we'll look at what some of those data have shown. <coughs> 
So again, during the natural cycle, um, an, an LH surge occurs when the, fo when the follicular diameter reaches about 22 to 24 millimeters. Um, most of the data on maturity has come from IVF. Um, these results are controversial, and it's very difficult to, um, to know whether or not these data are truly extrapolatable, if that's a word, from IVF to natural cycle or to IUI, or to, um, IUI inductions. Um, these results have come from the early studies back in the, um, in the late 80s and early 90s. Most of the data was done by abdominal ultrasonography. Um, our current standard is transvaginal ultrasonography. When you compare transvaginal versus abdominal ultrasonography, there's about a one to two centimeter difference. Um, the oncologists, the radiologists, they don't see the big difference between one to two centimeters, one to two millimeters, I'm sorry, uh, difference in um, follicular measurements, right? When, we're me when you're measuring a three centimeter versus a six centimeter, it matters, but three versus four centimeter ovarian cysts probably doesn't matter in the world of non-reproductive endocrinology. But for us, it matters. We're going to decide on seven mil 17 millimeters versus 18 millimeters. And, um, and so that, that, and I'm going to bring that up again as this talk goes on, that's an important distinction. Um, Again, fertilization rates and pregnancy rates have been a, lot, a, a large percentage of the studies that have um, assumed whether maturation occurred is really basing that maturation not on looking at nuclear and cytoplasmic maturation, but looking at whether or not fertilization and ultimate cleavage occurred. Um, again, maybe not extrapolatable to, um, to the IUI cycle. And again, most of these, su these studies have used downregulation. And when you downregulate a cycle, you're very unlikely for that to naturally ovulate. And so again, how does that down regulation affect not nuclear and cytoplasmic maturation? We, we just don't know. <laughs> um, Mitch Rosen at UCSF um, published a really nice study looking at IVF and maturity. And I, I find this study really fascinating. Um, what, what Mitch and uh, Marcel Cedars did was that they did single follicle puncture. They, before doing the puncture, they measured the mean diameter of the follicle. They then did the puncture, they measured the volume of the follicular um, fluid, and then they had each, follow, each individual egg looked at for, ma for maturity. And what they found was that when the, when the follicle size was greater than 18 millimeters, they had a 90% maturity. 90% of those follicles were, were produced a mature egg. Um, and as you can see, looking at the red bars, so the, the um, maturity here is represented by these red bars. As the follicles got smaller, the probability of maturity became less, and that's something w that we're not surprised about. But what I do find very surprising in this study is that when they punctured a follicle that was 10 to, tw 10 to 12 millimeters, again, this is IVF, this is stimulated IVF, when they punctured a follicle that was 10 to 12 millimeters, there was still a greater than 50% chance of that follicle producing a mature egg. And even in the follicles that were less than 10 millimeters, most of these were between 8 and 10 millimeters, there was still about a 50% chance of, re of retrieving a mature egg. So that idea that 16 millimeters is what we need to, re to produce maturity is, is just not true. 16 millimeters will give you a very high likelihood of maturity, but that's not to say those 10 and 8 and 10, 12 millimeter follicles aren't going to produce a mature follicle. And, and that's really important when dealing with the IUI for a number of reasons. One is because when we trigger our patients for IUI, we say, oh, there's one follicle that's 16 millimeters and the rest of them are 13 millimeters, so there's no chance of multiples, and that's certainly not true. Um, what was also interesting in this study was that um, fertilization rate. So some would argue they're mature, but there's a nuclear to cytoplasmic maturation difference. And so they won't cleave, they won't develop, they won't fertilize. But you can see here, represented in these gray bars, that when there was a mature follicle, the, the fertilization rate was 70%, whether that mature follicle, whether that mature egg came from an 18 millimeter follicle or an 8 millimeter follicle, the fertilization rate and the cleavage rates were the same. And then this is just looking at, again, the odds ratio of retrieving a mature follicle from the same paper. So while, so while we look at 16 millimeters, because that's where the reflection point is in this chart, um, as where we expect to get a mature follicle, um, we can still get a mature follicle from almost any follicle that's puncturable. 
But again, that, that data was from highly stimulated patients. These patients got very high levels of gonadotropin. And so maybe the follicles are different. Maybe those 10 millimeter follicles are different from a, from a, eight, from a 10, millimeter, 10 millimeter follicle in someone that's either going, undergoing a natural cycle or a, a low stimulation, a clomid cycle or a low dose FSH cycle. Um, so this data is extrapolated from Sone in 2008. And this is using IVM. These were unstimulated cycles. These were natural cycles where they punctured follicles. And again, not quite as high as what we saw in the Rosen paper. But nonetheless, in the 10 millimeter follicle range, it was still about 11% maturity. So even in the natural cycle, you can get mature follicles from small, mature eggs from small follicles.